So we've been talking about the year of excellence. The introduction's been the same for the last few weeks. We proclaim 2015 as the year of blessing, and this year, the year of excellence. 2 Peter 1.5 has been kind of our key verse, in your faith supply moral excellence. Excellence meaning extremely high quality and virtue. So where have we been so far? We've examined the importance of all people to first confess, repent, and die to sin while surrendering to Jesus as Savior and Lord. This begins the sanctified life and is maintained as we live holy lives through daily surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit. When we do this, it helps move us forward to a work of perfection, perfection as Christ rules in us. It is an ongoing work. We will never be perfect on this earth until Jesus gives us the glorified body. But he wants us to move in that direction. This is demonstrated by followers of Jesus, in part, by discovering our spiritual gifts. We talked about that last week. And using them for the glory of God to build up the church. Before we get any further, I want to extend again the invitation that you contact me if you want to talk about spiritual gifts, what yours is, and where that can be employed. I had four people last week, which I'm thrilled about. But we have 100 people in this congregation. Some of you already know your gift and you're using it for the glory of God. Keep it up. Others, please don't sit on it. A gift isn't any good unless you unwrap it, open it, and use it. Today we're going a little bit further. That was the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the part is to, for the glory of God to build up the church. But today we're going to feature the extremely high virtue of character. That starts with, again, goes back to the beginning of the series. It starts with, first of all, having a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have not received Christ as your Savior, you will not have the character of Christ. You may have resemblances of it here and there, but you will not have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, changing, transforming your character. Just as we're expected to know and use our spiritual gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit, we are to operate in life as people set apart to God, thereby different in character than those who are not Christians. Let me repeat that last sentence because it is becoming very muddled in our culture today. We are to operate in life as people set apart to God, thereby different in character than those who are not Christians. How we express ourselves should be different than how the world expresses itself. Somebody asked me one time, Pastor, what do you say when you hit your finger with a hammer? I say, I say, ouch, because my character is different. Do ideas come to mind sometimes to say something that would dishonor God? Yep, yeah. that old nature still pulls at us. But when we surrender and yield to God, even word choices that we use demonstrate we are different because we are transformed by Christ himself. Godly character is God commanded. We've used this verse a number of weeks now, but we got to come back for it because it really is a key passage of scripture for those who want to grow and be mature in faith. Romans 12, 1 and 2, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Living, which means it doesn't die. Now, the old nature is to die. That's the sacrifice part. And then the new nature in Christ is that we are living. We are not laying dormant, but we're actually engaged through the power of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God living in us. Our bodies that are a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, 
which is your spiritual service of worship. This morning when the worship team, we have communion usually before the service so that we can lead in worship and musically while the elements are being passed. And we prayed about that this morning, that we would be used as vessels for God's purposes. Just like in the Old Testament times, when the Hebrew people would go to the outer court, and then they would go to the inner court, the priests would go through the ceremonial and the functional uh, sanctifying of all the elements within the inner court that were going to be used on behalf of the people of Israel. So that those elements would be vessels that were acceptable to God as they were being used on behalf of the people. This is what God calls every believer to be. Acceptable to God to be used on behalf of God and His people and others. Because it is our spiritual service of worship. God expects us to And it's a part of what we are to be about if we claim to be followers of Christ. To the point, and verse 2 says this, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We can't read this verse enough. Because in our lives, we are, we are in this earthly struggle. We always want to kind of do what our, 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 our opinions say or our desires say rather than what does God say. And sometimes, well, actually many times, God, what God says really goes tilt to the way I want to live my life. If I strike my finger with a hammer, I want to say something different than ouch. Because that's how everybody expresses himself in the world, and I don't want to be different than that. My pet peeve as a believer and as your pastor is when people take the Lord's name in vain and they're not praying or they're not telling someone about God. Drives me nuts that the most hallowed and most appropriate name in the universe that we would hold in sacredness is used like a byline in the expression of the day. I even get upset when I see it in Facebook or, or when you text it and it's the, what, OMG? We know that stands for, oh my God. Folks, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I see Scripture concerned, that is not an expression of holiness or reverence. That's an expression of that name doesn't really mean much. And to the world it has become a swear word in the same frame that they use any other name that would be, we would be repulsed at. We are to be different if we are followers of God. We are to hold the name of God with great, great sacredness. That we would only use His name to explain to people the glory of God, to express the glory and the joy of the Lord. In prayer, but not bring Him into the street just to throw Him around as a way of expressing ourselves. To live in excellence of character requires absolute surrender of self to God. Absolute surrender. And this is the part that we struggle with. Because we don't want to be different. We don't want people to think we are weird in the world. I just read a, 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 a post, I think it was by Aaron Rainey, had put it in the Hibbing Tribune. And there were statistics in there, and the top three things, when they said, give us a perspective of Christianity in the world based upon what you think, I think the top one, 90%, was uh, something that it was, it was not intolerant. That was the second one. The first one uh, was that they hated, uh, hated homosexuals. The second one was that Christians were intolerant. And the third one, Uh, was that um, they don't listen to other people or something like that. None of it was positive. This is the image the world, the perspective the world has about Christians. And so on one hand we say, I am a Christian, but I'm not that Christian, which is true. But the world doesn't look at 
Christianity in pieces. It looks at it with one word, Christianity. Even now, in the political arena, and i got to be careful where I tread here, but in the political arena, the word evangelical now is even defined differently in the Christian community. There's the evangelical voting block, and there's the evangelical spiritual block, if you will. The world sees evangelical with one blanket. If you're an evangelical, then you believe this. And so we struggle with, well, I don't want to be looked upon like that kind of Christian, but the only way that we're going to be looked upon differently is if we're actually uh, led by the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That we walk in the Holy Spirit. That we demonstrate Jesus the way He is meant to be demonstrated in the world. And we can't do that in the flesh. We can't do that in our own opinions. We are to be set apart to God. The excellence of character requires absolute surrender to the, of self to God. There is no fudging there. That means, as we get to the next one, that godly character is godly living. Romans 6, 1-14 through 14 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace continues? That's the logic of the world. And, and immature believers is like, well, you know, if, if God's grace is a great thing, and it is, it's wonderful, then if I continue to sin and ask God to forgive me, then it really demonstrates the grace of God, and therefore it's a good thing. Uh, and the Apostle Paul said, may it never be. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? If we're saying God's grace is sufficient and it can and it can save me from my sins, and I can live a different life, then why would I go back to that death life? Because then it doesn't demonstrate the grace and mercy of God. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, meaning spiritual baptism, dead to self and alive to Christ, have been baptized into uh, His death? Therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, we are dead to self, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. The uh, water immersion that we use in baptism, when we take an individual and we have them standing here and they testify that they are a follower of Christ, and then we lay them in the water and then bring them back up again, that is a physical demonstration of an act that has already happened spiritually. That we have died to self. In other words, I give up my rights. I give up my old nature. I give up who I was born into as a sinner. And now I am a follower of Christ. I am a new creature. I am different. So different that people, when they see me, when they talk to me, they won't disrespect me. They might might be a few, but they will see that I am different. There's something hopeful and something positive and something attractive in that individual. What is it? It is in Christ, in me, the hope of glory. Therefore, we are to be buried with him through baptism and death and then raised as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Jesus in the likeness uh, of his death, then certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We will live as resurrected people, resurrected from the dead. Those of us that were dead in Christ are no longer dead in, or dead in our sins. We're no longer dead in our sins, but we're alive in Christ. We identify in Christ's death and also his resurrected. And knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would be, no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. You hear that? Now we may go on in sin again, but we don't have to because we've been freed from it. We're no longer in bondage to sin. Because of Christ in us. And if Christ, if we have died with Christ, 
then we believe we also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And get this, even so, then, consider yourselves to be dead to sin forever. And alive to God in Christ Jesus. If that's true, and we believe it is, if we're followers of Christ, then it says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God, to be utilized for God and by God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law. You're no longer living the law of thou shalt and thou shalt not. Now we're living under the law of grace, which says I will live this way as Christ is in me for his glory and his purpose. Of course, the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we? And that's a daily question we should ask. If we put to death our old self, then it stands to reason we will be new and different. Think for a moment. When Jesus was resurrected, remember the story about the road to Emmaus? A couple of his disciples are walking along the road to Emmaus. They're grieving. They're in sorrow because they're Their Savior, the one they thought was going to save the world, had died. They saw him crucified. They saw him buried. And they're walking on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus walks up behind them. Hey, guys, what's happening? What's the response? Are you the only one in Jerusalem that hasn't heard? Are you the only one that doesn't know what's going on? And they start almost berating him because they didn't recognize him. Because he was different. He was now in his resurrected state. Remember he told the disciples when he made the appearance at the, at the upper room, he said, don't touch me, but look at my hands. Look at this, look at my side. There's something unique. There was something different. And when they began to talk to him, they knew it was him. But there was a change that took place. And I don't know exactly what it was. The scripture doesn't give us full details. But when a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, the burden is lifted out of that person. If you've seen it, and I believe most of you have, most of you probably experienced it, you know what it is to be walking in this conundrum of sin and, 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 and misery and despondency, and you, you think to yourself, there's got to be something better in life. And then Jesus comes along and says, I am the way the truth of the life. I am better than life itself. And so people who take that step of faith and they say, Jesus, you know what? I'm going to repent. Put this sin to death. My sin life put to death. I want to be resurrected in Jesus. And we experience what the scripture says, being born again. Suddenly, same body, same person, but it's different. There's a, there's, a, 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 there's a hope in us. There's a, a bounce in our step. And usually what new believers do is they, they launch offensively sometimes. They launch at people. And it's like, oh man, you've got to hear about Jesus. He did this greatest thing. And, and so a lot of people are kind of, whoa, you know, and a lot of mature Christians, possibly mature Christians, Say, oh, slow down, kid. You know, hey, you'll get, don't worry, you'll get used to this and it'll all die off and then you can just go to church and have a good time. And what does Jesus want? Get out there. Go tell people what I've done. If we put to death our old self, then it stands to reason we will be new. We will be different than the world. We will be different than the world. Godly character is God's character. Galatians 5 says this, I say walk by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, 
and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. It's still going to come at us. But if we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry those things out. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You are now under grace, under God's direction through the Holy Spirit. Now the deeds of the flesh... Here's our, our, our evident. Okay, so here's a checklist. If you're involved in any of these things here, that means that you haven't surrendered or I haven't surrendered this thing to God. And therefore, I'm not walking in the Spirit as I ought. The deeds of the flesh are evident. They are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, which is putting anything in front of God, more important, Sorcery, enmities, strife, arguing, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Of which I forewarned you, Paul said, just as I forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, those people that refuse to give that over to God, those people that want to live that way, and that's what they want, have pushed God aside. Now, for most believers, we don't embrace all those things, but there are, there are things for sometimes believers, there's this Achilles heel, if you will, this one thing that we really like to do and we get pleasure from it, even though we know it doesn't please God. And it's an offense to God. It's a sin. As we battle that Achilles heel. And what Paul said here in the book of Galatians, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the things of the flesh. Matter of fact, if we walk by the Spirit, verse 22, or 21, uh, and 20, or 22, excuse me, with the fruit of the Spirit, the contrast to the world, the thing that makes us look different and be different than what the world does. And we are to be different. Remember that. If you blend in so well that someone says, wow, I never even knew you were a Christian, that is not a good thing. That's not. You know, if they go, wow, I knew you for five years, I didn't know you went to church, that's not a good thing. We are to be so different, not abnormal, but so different that the love of Christ, the person of Christ, just shines out of us. It is through the fruit of the Spirit that that happens. It is the transformation of our character that demonstrates that we are in Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is love. People have misinterpreted disagreeing with homosexuality in the Christian world as hating homosexuals. And there's a difference. God loved Jesus when he walked the earth. He loved everybody. Remember the woman that had, had lived with multiple partners at the woman at the well? He didn't, he didn't have her come up and say, oh, you know, I really don't like you because of what you do. Rather, he said, I want to give you everlasting life. Just don't go and sin anymore. When you discover truth, don't go back to the well of sin. Unfortunately, in our conversations, sometimes we carry those conversations into the public, and the public doesn't understand our terminology. And they overhear us talking about biblical standards, and it's like, oh, see, they are talking against people again. We have to be cautious that way. We are to, the scripture says we're to allow our speech to be seasoned with grace. But not give up the truth. Not deny the truth. Just seasoned with love. That you love someone. Listen, you want to put this in a hard terminology? You think about the violence that's going on in the world and that God loves those incredibly violent people 
He loves them. And then he says, we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others. Even the violent ones. Because it's God's desire that none should perish. That's hard to do when you're seeing the violence and the brutality in the world. It doesn't mean we stand for justice because God is a God of justice, but it does mean that we love. We don't want revenge. We don't want malice. We don't want wrath. We want God to intervene and use us in the way that He desires us to be used. People who are followers of God should have a fruit of the spirit of joy. Some of you know that my good friend that has spoken in this church, Bob Aspling, died a little over a week ago. His wife, Patty, who also spoke with him, is now grieving. And yet in the midst of her grief, there is a joy that cannot be explained to people who don't know God. Because the Spirit of God has control of her emotions. Not that she's not sad. She's desperately sad. Not that she doesn't grieve. She is grieving. But she has a peace in there, a joy, because of God in her. And that's the other one, is the peace. Peace. Christianity, when people come to faith in Christ, there's never anywhere in Scripture that says Christians won't experience tough times. Matter of fact, the Scripture says kind of the opposite. Plan and persecution, things aren't going to look too good. Uh, people are going to hate you for because they hate me. But in the midst of it, we can still walk in peace. An inner contentment that only God can give. We can have patience when we feel like being impatient. And that's one we have to work on. Uh, well, okay, that's one I have to work on. Um, because usually if you're ready for a patient, a patient moment, <laughs> you're not going to be tested, right? It's when something happens, it's like, ah! and you want to react. Kindness. How we treat other people. Goodness. Not because it's expected, but because this is how we're built now in Christ, that we treat others with goodness. Faithfulness. That we stand ready to be faithful before God again and again and again, no matter what goes on in our life. We have a gentleness about us. People aren't afraid to talk to us because we can be irritable, because... We rub them the wrong way, but rather there's a gentleness in us because Christ is in us. There's a self-control where we don't immediately launch at our trigger that sets us off, but rather we're under the control of the Holy Spirit. And I know that many of us are probably sitting here going, man, those are such great qualities. I wish I had that one or that one. And the reality is God says that we are to walk in the Spirit as we continue to do that every day, surrender to God, that those qualities become more and more stabilized in our life. We become more and more like Christ. The key is that we walk by the Spirit. Verse 24 says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. With its passions and its desires, we have put to death that which opposes God. Elsewhere in Scripture, it says we take up the cross daily and follow Jesus. We are to be visible demonstrations of what it is to be Jesus Christ. In our thoughts, in our actions, in our character in our word choices, in how we love our families, how we treat people at work, how we treat people when we're driving our cars. Everything. The key is walk by the Spirit. 
a life in the Spirit is without question different. Catch that, please. A life in the Spirit is without question different. Your acquaintances, your friends, your neighbors, your family members should say to themselves when they're talking amongst themselves about you, he or she is just different. Not different like, he's weird, but different like he just seems, she just seems so in control of life. At peace. Doesn't treat people with malice, but treats them with respect. What causes that in a person's life? And we know the answer is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Excellence of character requires death to self. And it really all begins with desire. Which do we want most? A Jesus life or an earthly life? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. If we desire to have the character of Jesus, we must take steps for excellence of character. And here's just a few. Interact with God daily. That's prayer. It's reading the Bible. It's letting God speak to us through His Word, and we get to speak to God in prayer. Position ourselves for instruction. Church services are not here as a convenience or an opportunity when you feel like, I need a boost. They're here to give instruction to our spiritual lives. The Bible studies that you're involved with are, or have opportunity for are to give instructions of how we're to live our life and apply those truths. Radio broadcasts, TV broadcasts, those things that are there to teach us the Word of God. We need and should expose ourselves to those things and learn from those things. Deny the world's influences. This is a really hard one because the influence is all around us. But judicious Lee should be L-Y there. TV viewing. Websites, Facebook, friends, posts. The things that we get texts and what we hear from. You know, if we're, if we're surrounded in a circle of friends that are constantly anti-God and what they, how they approach life, then perhaps, and I know this comes hard because it's hard to give up friends, but are they truly friends if they will not allow you to be different? to the point that you're a witness in how you live your life. Stand firm in your faith despite ridicule and opposition and make your first priority Jesus. When it comes to your time, your first and my first priority should be Jesus. When it comes to our money, our first priority should be Jesus. When it comes to decision-making, our first priority should be Jesus. Everything. I remember when I was younger, I would ask that question, well, man, God, it sounds, like I'm, it sounds like everything I'm supposed to do is surrounded about you. Duh. Yeah. Because God's desire is for our greater good. And when we put Jesus at the center of all of our life, then He will provide the greater good that we could possibly imagine. It's all about Jesus. And He wants our character to reflect that unique difference that's attractive and will draw people to Himself. We're going to have communion together. As the worship team comes forward, I'm just going to ask that each one of us would evaluate right now in prayer